Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sabir, and I direct events here at The Strand. Before we launch into discussion of Lorenzo Carcatera's newest book, Three Dreamers, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until, after over 94 years, The Strand is the sole survivor, now run by third-generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers, authors like Lorenzo and Adriana, we wouldn't be here today, and we are so truly appreciative of it. Tonight, or correction, this afternoon, we are truly thrilled to have with us Lorenzo Carcatera for the launch of his new memoir, Three Dreamers, A Memoir of Family. Lorenzo is the number one New York Times bestselling author of A Safe Place, Sleepers, Apaches, Gangsters, Street Boys, Paradise City, Chasers, Midnight Angels, The Wolf, Tin Badges, and Payback. He's a former writer slash producer for Law and & Order and has written for National Geographic Traveler, The New York Times Magazine, among others. His next novel will feature Nana Maria as a fictional detective in Nana Maria and the Case of the Missing Bride. He lives in New York City. Joining Lorenzo in conversation is Adriana Trigiani. Adriana is the New York Times bestselling author of 18 books in fiction and nonfiction, which have been published in 38 languages around the world. She is an award-winning playwright, television writer, and producer, and filmmaker. She wrote and directed the film version of her debut novel, Big Stone Gap, which was shot entirely on location in her Virginia hometown. Her screen adaptation, Very Valentine, debuted on Lifetime Television in June 2019. Adriana directed the feature film, Then Came You, starring Craig Ferguson and Kathy Lee Gifford, filmed on location in Scotland. The film was released in October 2020, debuting as number one comedy in America. Adriana is the co-founder of The Origin Project, an in-school writing program that serves more than 1,700 students in Appalachia. Adriana is at work on her next novel for Dutton at Penguin Random House and a children's book for Viking at Penguin Random House. Adriana hosts a weekly Facebook live show, Adriana Inc., every Tuesday evening at 6 p.m., featuring guest authors, giveaways, and more. You can follow along with Adriana and Facebook on Facebook and Instagram at Adriana Trigiani. Adriana lives in Greenwich Village with her family. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Lorenzo and Adriana to the stage. Oh, it's the Strand Applause Machine, Lorenzo. <laughs> How are you, Adri? How you doing? Oh, so great to see you. Um, I love your book so Thank you, much. Thank you. I want everybody to get it for Mother's Day because I think it's the perfect gift about three incredible women. You know, I knew your beautiful wife that's now in heaven, Susan, and I think you captured her perfectly on the page. Thank you. I was thrilled to see because I think what's so beautiful about this book is that, you know, really, Lorenzo, if something happens, like if a bus hits you, look, the kids know the story. Right. And my okay. grandson will say well, it. Joke. Yeah. I said a buzz hitting. That's my favorite go-to joke. But the point is <laughs> so beautifully rendered. So <clears throat> I love your other books. I think you can see, can you see payback up there? Oh, I don't know. No, because it's over there. But, um, you know, your books are known for their action and their uh, plotting and their cinematic veracity and um, street honesty um they're very edgy and then you write this 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 beautiful love letter to three women in your life that you know were really irreplaceable and grew your heart well you know it was a in a way it was it was written for a couple of reasons one i wanted to say thank you to them you know i i wouldn't be here talking to you if it wasn't for nona maria and my mother and and susan um, and, he, and they all had a different approach. I mean, I went, you know, I had this crazy idea when I was a kid to be a writer. 
I didn't even know what it meant. And certainly Nona Maria, who, you know, as far as I know, I never saw her read anything. I don't know if she could read. My mother read uh, religious pamphlets and it progressed so on occasion, but mostly listened to uh, religious uh, programming. Susan Byte was already an, an established editor and writer. Um, but, you know, what I meant was I wanted to work on a newspaper. The idea of books and scripts didn't even enter my mind. But they went in it with complete blind faith, Nona and my mother, that that, all right, this is what you want to do, even though we don't know what that is. I might as well have told them I wanted to be an astronaut to land on, you know, go to Mars. They wouldn't, they would have backed it though. And they backed it with, with stories and anecdotes. But most importantly, they, 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 they backed it with the way they handled their life. And Nona had had a difficult life. My mother certainly had, um, you know, by the time my mother was 24 years old, uh, she had lost a husband in the war, a six month old baby and her brother. Um, so they had all this weight of tragedy on them, but Nona never showed it. My mother did show it only because she then married, foolishly married my father, uh, after she was a widow, uh, which I never quite understood. It was an arranged marriage that didn't work, but they just encouraged me each in, a, in, in their own way. Grandma was very, they were gifted storytellers. They didn't realize it, but grandma was a great storyteller. My mother was a great storyteller. And then Susan's part was she had this deep held belief that, you know, even during my worst periods as a writer, when I was barely getting by as a, uh, making money, not, I mean, not being published by places, being published by places you wouldn't want to read, you know, that magazines that were sold only in prison, right. um, that she really be believed that I would get to write books and scripts and do all this stuff. And it was just, I didn't know where that core belief came from. So, it was a nice thing. It was a way to say thank you to these three terrific women. And also, as you read it, I, I hope as people read it, that we've all been touched by women in our lives, and especially men, I think. Men are less, it seems, more reluctant to talk about it. But if you think about it, especially if you think back on your own life, you can think of a mother, your aunt, uh, sister, somebody who's kind of directed you or indirectly directed you on your own path and, and kept you on that line. So it was a way to say thank you. It was a way to keep the memory alive there, even though they're with me all the time, but to keep, it was great to be in this room writing it and having them, you know, you know what that's like. It's a weird feeling when you're writing, but they're right here. You see, you can see them all the time when you're writing about them. And I, I kind of love that feeling. So it was a nice change of pace for me. And I'm, uh, I'm thrilled I wrote it. I hope the, People like it, but uh, if nothing else, it's a book to be read, but for my kids, as you said, and for my grandson to read one day about. But what's wonderful, Lorenzo, is it's very aspirational. So when you read this, it makes it makes you want to write things down about the women in your right. line right. and family, and it makes you want to embrace them. And I thought you, I think it's your finest work because you describe them, I know them from, from the way you write about them. I love the stories you pulled. I mean, your love story with Susan was really quite beautiful and, and in a sense involved your family. Yes. Because my mother's you, were, you were assigned a story about Sunday dinner or something, right? Well, the first story I went in, she was an editor, I was a clerk, which, you know, and you know the, the way it worked at the Daily News, which by the way, back in the 70s was not, uh, it was a very difficult place to work if you were a woman in the 70s. They didn't make it easy. But there was a, you know, the, there was a pecking order. And the editor, Susan, was up here, and I was, like, sort of in the sub-basement. So to approach her, she edited the Sunday Entertainment section, which was, back then, don't think of the circulation as you see it today. The daily circulation of the Daily News back then, this is in the late 70s, was two and a half million papers a, a day on the Monday to f Saturday but three and a half million on Sunday. That's okay. huge. Can you explain to everybody there was a Sunday section in it? Uh, the Sunday was, section. Which was everybody's was, Bible. That's how you knew. Yeah, that was the entertainment that. section. That was the 25, 30 page section called Leisure. So to get in there, that got you quite, a, you know, you got read by a lot of people. But because you're a clerk and it was a union place, I couldn't, she couldn't come over to me and say, hey, I'd like you to write this, this, and this. She couldn't assign anything. 
and they had staff people. So you couldn't say, hey, Clint Eastwood has a new movie out. I'd like to interview, interview Clint. That's not going to happen. So you had to come in with something out of the box with enough of a lead time that that she could run. So I found out back then there were five TV stations. This is how old I am now. And one of the stations was showing a Three Stooges marathon like a month from now. And I was a huge Three Stooges fan. And I remember talking to my friend Hank. I said, I'm going to go in and pitch the Three Stooges story essay to Susan. And he looked at me like I was crazy. He said, you know, she went to Bennington. She probably never saw the Three Stooges. I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll talk to her. And the word, the word was out that she didn't like me. Like she always liked, you know, she, she made a point when she came by the clerk's test uh, desk, say hello to a bunch of guys, but never to me. So I said, all right. So I went into our office and she, I sat, she sat down and I sat down and I pitched the Three Stooges and she, she wouldn't assign it. She assigned it on spec. She said, only because I don't know if you can write. I don't know anything about you, basically. I said, all right. So I spent a week working on it, and she she um, she published it. And it got me some attention, including I got invited to a Three Stooges dinner and was named like Stooge of the Year or some, something. I like love that. that. And they said I could bring somebody. So I went over to – I went into her, her office. I went in – I went over to her office, and I said, uh, listen, I got in – I was named Stooge of the Year or whatever they came up with. And I was wondering if um, you'd like to go with me, you know, since you're the editor and I, you know. And all she said was, uh, will I get hit by a pot with a pie? I said, well, just in case, don't wear your best outfit. And and then we, we went out. So we became friends. And off of that, I started writing for her more. And a friendship drew out of that. And we became friends for a few years. And then, then – uh, and then you fell in love. When did you know you were in love with her? Well, it was a diff it was difficult because of this. A, she was my boss. So that was an issue. B, she was everything an Italian mother would not want. She was older than me. She had been divorced. She smoked. My mother said she smokes without eating food. I said, I, I, what does that even mean? She goes, it's not a good thing. Uh, and uh, and she drinks wine. I said, well, you drink wine. She goes, I drink wine with meals. I bet she drinks wine just with wine and not, no food. So she says she smokes and drinks wine with no food. She could be an alcoholic. I said, no, just calm down. And uh, Italian mothers are not easy to please when it comes no. to No. Uh, because my mother, I'll tell you, my mother had, my mother, we had no money. My mother would dole out. Uh, whether it was a dollar, two dollars, whatever she could squeeze out, every month would send it to this orphanage, an all-girls orphanage in Pompeii, where she knew the mother superior personally, the whole bit. So one day I was like, I might have been 16 or so. My mother sits me down and said, listen, when you're ready to get married, we have, we've picked out the perfect young lady for you. At the orphanage. At the orphanage. And my mother did it for a strategic reason. She had really difficult issues with her in-laws. So she thought this would avoid in-law problems. There would be no in-laws. Oh. And B, she'd have a friend who spoke Italian, who could cook, the perfect wife. And I said, I mean, I said, so you made a deal with the nuns? I mean, this, you do this? And she said, yeah, we'll send, they'll send you pictures and folders and she'll be eight when she gets out when she's 18. So, you know, you hear it once, twice. I kind of humored her for years. I said, yeah, mom, whenever you're ready, whenever I'm ready, I'll, you know, I'll give you a heads up. So then when I met Susan, the first thing she said was, well, what do I tell the orphan? Who had been waiting patiently, it turns out, for two, three years for me to marry her. So, hello, it was, it was, a, um, it was an interesting way to grow up. I mean, my mother never spoke English. She was here 35 years. And her point was born in Iskia, die in Iskia. And, and Nona, by the time I met Nona, I was 14. I think Nona had the probably the biggest effect because she got me at the at the right age. I was a teenager coming in from New York. and I, I love the stories of, like, the things she'd have you do and you made friends there. And right. it was like you spent your summers on the island of Iskia. Yeah, which is a beautiful island, which, you know, you fall in love. I mean, it was one of those places, as I got it, now they have hydrofoils, but it was the big boats then, which took 90 minutes. 
But the minute I got off that big boat and, and uh, I was 14, I just felt I belonged. This is where, you know, I wasn't like I was visiting an island that I'd never been to or I don't know anybody here. And I had to lift my bags and go to visit Nona's house. And, and she lived about literally 75 feet from the beach and she never went to the beach. She wore the widow's black all the time. She was about, you know, typical Italian grandma. She was about 4'11". And, but had this beautiful thick hair, a uh, head of white hair, walked with a limp. And she was a very private person. Like she would never ask you anything personal and no personal questions whatsoever, even the most innocent personal question. But by the same token, she didn't want you to ask her anything. And she had this thing where she'd only drank coffee during the day, but strong Italian coffee like with three uh, espresso with two pieces of dark chocolate in it, uh, stock 84, remember the Italian brandy, three sugars. I mean, a dozen cups of coffee like that a day. And then at night, switched to white wine. She never drank water because uh, during the war, the water was, you know, brown from the bombings and all. So she always had that in the back of her head. Um, and, and she had this theory that if on a super hot day, if it was really, really hot, if you drink something like hot, her hot coffee fast, your body inside cools and you'd be like, like it's not no longer hot. And uh, I, I did that one day and I drank it. She said, you have to have, it was a hot August day. And Nona said, no, no, you have this coffee, you'll be cool in no time. So I drank the coffee as I was walking up the hill to past St. Peter's Church uh, away from her house. I was like, it looked like I had malaria. I was just drenched in sweat. And, uh, and it's so hot there in the summer. Can you even explain how hot it is? Because I would like put um, take a like a it, 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 uh, like a like a wash rag and I put ice in it and stick it in my back pocket. I couldn't. It's so it. hot, the sweat. You'll see the sweat so just hot. running. You're running down your fingertip. What's nice is that in the in the evening it gets cool. But you know how Italians are. If you get a slight, I I, I only stayed at my mother's apartment. I used to go there every year, but the first year. I took my family, I made the mistake of staying in my mother's apartment. And Italian mothers hate drafts, you know, which we call cool air, but they hate, they hate drafts. So my mother would lower the blinds and, oh. and I mean, we were drenched in sweat and my mother's wearing wool socks, a sweater over her shoulders. Like it's, you know, uh, yeah, it's the worst. in New York city. And I'd say, my, I said, we're dying here. I mean, I, I can't. And then they bring out the the lunch, which is huge bowls of pasta and the brajol and then the, the, the sausage and the, then the chicken. And, and you're, you know, you're just sweating and eating it. And my wife was not used to this. She goes, why can't we just eat a sandwich at the beach? Why do we have to be here and sweat? Uh, so it was it was a different world, but it's a world I miss to this day. And and oh, you know, I, I was very close to my aunts, my mom's sisters, and my cousin. It was a big. You just sort of knew everybody on the island. The is anybody there. left there now, Lorenzo? My uncle Mario is. Uh, I believe he's eighty eight. Wow. So two packs a day, drinks a bottle of wine, chases women like crazy, and uh, he's still all right. He's he's the last man standing. Um, but do you, no, have, do you have do you have a house there? Do you stay in your grandmother's house, or how do you do it? I stay in. I, I actually stay at a hotel because I, the hotel's like family cousins run it, and you know they and they treat me really nicely. Uh, grandma left us two apartments each. Each child she had six children. Each ch child got two apartments. She was very she couldn't read or write probably, but she was a very savvy businesswoman, and she had this. Uh, the Italian government built the. Uh, building for her six children and each wow. one each one got two apartments i was the younger of the two so i got the garden apartment i have a half brother who got the upstairs of the bigger apartment mm -hmm. and um but but nona was just a really smart savvy and and instinctively knew how to um guide me but through st telling her terrific stories um I mean, if I could share one story with her, but she had two photos in her house. It was one of those old stone houses that you don't see anymore, two-story stone house. So one photo, and each photo had those thick brown wooden frames from like the 30s. Mm -hmm. So one was on, 
on one wall where she always sat across from, and I knew that was my grandfather, Gabriel, who had died in the, the year I was born, 1954. She always sat facing him. On the other side was a photo of the same kind of frame, but this young, handsome guy couldn't have been more than 18, 19, thick hair, really a good looking guy. So I waited until I knew her a little bit before I asked. And uh, so we're having lunch one day and I said, no, no, who is that? Whose picture is that? And she said, that's your uncle John. So I thought by that point I'd met every uncle that, you know, that I could meet. So I said, oh, doesn't he live in Ischia? And rather than answer that, she said, when I was in Naples giving birth to Uncle Joe, who you have met, and I said, yes, it was my last child and they're getting the babies ready to, to go home. And your grandfather was outside next to the mother superior smoking a pipe and they knew us pretty well because we'd been there many times. And all the uh, children, the boys were being prepared first. All the boys were being prepared, but there was a boy off to the side alone. And your grandfather said to the mother superior, is he okay? Is the baby sick? And she said, no, abandonado, filo di nessuno, he's no one's child, he's abandoned. So she said, your grandfather stayed quiet for a few minutes and he said, uh, so what happens to him now? And he said, well, once these other children go home with their mothers, we'll prepare him and take him to the orphanage down, there's the orphanage again, the boys orphanage down the road and they'll take care of him and raise him. Again, he stayed quiet for a few minutes and then finally, and you could never do this today, I don't think. He finally said to the mother superior, can I take him? And she said, well, you're going to have to sign some papers. And he didn't ask my grandmother, didn't do anything. He said, let's go sign the papers. So he signed the papers. The first time Nona knew that they had a second child was she was getting her dress buttoned. She turned around and Nona uh, came in with the nuns and there were two babies. And she looked at him and he said, I'll explain on the boat. Don't worry. So they went on and then grandma said, listen, no parent, and you know this as a parent, will admit that they have a favorite child. But your uncle, we named him John, your grandfather and John were like inseparable from a young age, from the youngest age. Wow. They, he worked in the fields with him, he did this, he did that. They were just uh, ironclad tight. Then she said, unfortunately came a war that none of us asked for. And he was assigned submarine duty. Uh, my uncle, oh, and he's 19 years old. And she said, I don't know what it's called. Uh, these, uh, this British uh, ship threw these uh, things into the water that explode. Turned out they were depth charges. And it was the only time she showed any vulnerability while she told that story. She paused, sipped some coffee, and she said, my son must have died such a horrible death. So then she said, anyway, your grandfather's home from the fields. He was the shepherd that day, and he's working on something uh, on the house. And the car pulled up, and out came a priest and some military people. And it was with my Uncle John's belongings and a flag and some medals. And my grandfather said, stop. Don't get on my property. Do you have my son? I want my son. And the priest who knew him said, Gabriel, it's just to bring his effects and show their respects and said, if you don't have my son, get back in the car and leave. Get off my property. And then she paused and she said, cancer killed your grandfather 10 years later. But in truth, he died that day. So that's who that is in that photo. Oh, my God. So she had this magical way of telling. That story stays with you forever. Once you hear that, you can't shake. Yeah. You, know, so, you know, we have uh, uh, Nora checking in, and she said, Lorenzo, you're the best storyteller. I agree. I think everyone who's listening agrees. Thank you, Nora. Um, so anyway, she, she, that's, so that was her way of encouraging me to you know, be, a, be a writer. And one thing she did do that I, I will, I mean, there are many things she did do that I will never forget, but my father was a gambler and always gambled money away and all that. So I was going to a high school that cost $65 a month. And my mother called from New York one, one day while I was there and she was in complete panic. We, I was working part-time jobs. I was doing some stuff in East Kid too for money. And we had put enough aside to pay for the tuition for the year at Mount St. Michael. And my mother, of course, always just got hysterical, said, it's gone. He gambled it away. There's no more money for you to go to school. I said, mom, just relax. I'll, 
you know, we'll pay them by the month. We'll, I'll figure out a way. We'll come up with some when I get back. And uh, so somehow, I guess Nona heard about it through my, from my mother or for somebody told her. So anyway, the night before I was going to leave, go back to America, Nona said to me, listen, I, I had the tailor make you a pair of khaki pants. Would you do me a favor? Would you wear them on the flight tomorrow for me? I said, sure. Uh, so the next day I said goodbye to her. I never looked back. I never wanted, every time I left her, I, I was crying. So I didn't want her to see that. Aww. And uh, so I'm on the plane. You know, it takes forever to go from Iska by boat. Then you got to go to train by to Rome and all of that. So, but I'm on the plane to New York and the, my side here bothered me. It was in the khakis. There was like something there. So I went to the bathroom. I closed the door. I, I undid I undid the uh, pants and it was like a little pouch sewn into the pants. So I ripped the pouch up and I opened it. And in American dollars was to the penny, the exact amount of money I needed to pay for one year's tuition of wow. high school. So I, I had a caller when I got back. I waited until everybody was out of the apartment. My father was gone. My mother was gone. I called her and I said, no, no, I love you for what you did, but I can't take your money. She said, what money? I said, the money that you've sewed in my khaki. She said, listen, the tailor made you the pants. I told you it was a great tailor. If there's money in it, you got to call him and thank him. So she never even copped to that. I mean, she was just so cool about things. And um, she just gave you a lot to remember. Well, here's a question. What gives you the, what gave you, clearly the women in your life were inspirational, but no matter what, what gave you the courage to become a writer? I mean, it's, it's a very hard road. It is a hard road, and it's hard, especially when you, you know, you and I didn't know anybody, I, you know. I didn't know anybody. I mean, I told one of my uncles here in New York, I was thinking of why I wanted to work at the Daily News. He goes, I know a guy, I can, I can get you in there. So I said, as a reporter, he goes, no, you know, driving a truck. So the idea of you becoming a reporter was, and I think there was this drive, and I got lucky early on. I, I met guys like Pete Hamill, who helped a lot. And my mother, who used negative stories as well as positive stories, her negative her negative stories didn't make me not want to do it. Her negative stories gave me the strength to say, listen, maybe it was why she told me a lot of the negative stories, because she had such a hard life. But it made me want to prove her wrong. I remember the first job I got in after high school was at a bank, again, that no longer exists, called Manufacturers Hanover Trust. And it paid 95 bucks a week which was a lot of money in 1976. And um, I told my mother I got the job and here's the first thing she said, she says, never quit this job, never leave this job. This is as good as it's gonna get for you. I said, wow. Sad. And they put me in the check reconcilement department and to this day, I don't know what that means. So, but I, I was, what the lesson that taught me though, I was working next to people who were supporting families. They were making maybe 10, 20 bucks more than I was a week but they were supporting families with kids. And, you know, I was supporting my parents. My father was in and out of work and, you know, doing these fregazi deals. But so her negative stories gave me the courage to move on, I think. And, and you know, you just got to keep doing it. You know, uh, as our friend Sonny Gross used to say, you got to hit that brick wall every day with your bang against that wall, bang against that wall. That wall to, to and eventually the brick will the bricks will part. You need a little luck, a lot of luck. You need talent and you need, uh, you need to stay at it. You can't give it up. And the easy thing is to give it up. But yeah. You, but you know, Lorenzo, you had huge success with your book, your books, the sleepers they made into a movie. And then you worked in television for those, that wonderful uh, group over there at, um, what is it? Law and order. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, right. Law and Order was a lot of fun. Law and Order is a great. Um, my friend Mary Testa always says, you know, I, I watch Law and Order, and 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 I'm I, I'm only satisfied when I see a friend on it because every episode, every New York actor, 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 yeah, yeah, there's somebody in there. Yeah. Um, so for you, um, you didn't start out as a dramatist. You started out as a journalist. I started well. We called it news. I was a reporter for the Daily News. We don't give ourselves that highfalutin journalist thing, but um, it was fun. I loved being at the Daily News. The Daily News, to me, I, I felt comfortable there because it was like a dysfunctional family that I was grown up 
grew up in. I mean, you know, it was mostly Italian Irish guys from Queens and Brooklyn and Manhattan. Um, I'll never forget, I was a copy boy, and this guy, uh, this other copy boy, stabbed a guy in the leg with a scissor. So a copy boy is a group one. That's the lowest group. Highest group is group 10, salary wise. So this guy stabs a guy in the leg with the scissor. And the next day I said to the head of copy boys, I said, what happened to him? He goes, oh, he's down in the, pr they moved, they transferred him to the printer, to the printer's floor. I said, well, that's a group four. He goes, what's your point? I said, the guy stabbed somebody and he got promoted. I said, are you serious? This is how things work here? Yeah. It, was, it was crazy. It was a crazy atmosphere, but I, I, I hated being a copy boy. I truly hated being a copy boy. But, um, and I'll tell you a story that my, with my wife, I was, I was not, we were not romantically involved yet. Um, Susan had a flight to catch. It was a Friday, late Friday night. She had a flight to catch to Cincinnati. She was going to go see her father in Cincinnati. And she said, listen, and the place was a union shop, so they could never fire anyone. So there was a lot of these people in their late 80s into their 90s who were still on payroll who they wouldn't give anything to do. Um, they couldn't give anything to do. So they just sat there and read books or whatever they did. So um, one of them was Flo. She was a sweet old woman. So Susan comes running out of the ladies' room and says, listen, I got a flight to catch. Old lady flows in the ladies' room, and I think she's dead. Check it out. I got to go. And she leaves. I said, she's dead. So now I go to the head of the copy boys, because that's who you go to. And I said to the head of copy boys, Milty was his name. I said, Milty, old lady flows in the ladies' room, and she might be sick or deady. So he's smoking a cigar. He goes, hang on a sec. How do you know she's in the ladies' room? Have you been in there? I said, no. So now I got to go back and explain the whole story. And he said, well, well, you think she's dead? I said, I don't know. I haven't seen her. But they say, Susan Tepfer said she probably is dead. So he looks at the, at the clock, the big clock in the city room. And he's off in about 20 minutes. He goes, well, if she's dead now, she'll be dead for the night shift. Why won't we let them worry about it? So... <laughs> I said, why don't we just send the copy girl in there to oh, see? What she and they eventually did, and she basically she fell asleep on the on the, in the on the toilet, and uh, and they had to like drag her out. It was a little anyway. It was that that kind of place. It was a crazy. It was a great place, as Pete Hamill said. It was a great place to grow up, learn the trade, and then leave at a certain age. If you stay there forever. It's not going to help your cause. But he was, he was an interesting character. What did you like about him? I think his generosity was, I mean, he was great. What he spent, I mean, I was freelancing for a lot of places that, you know, uh, and I would, I would just put any article I did on his desk. And when he had time, he would call me over. And I love, to this day, God rest his soul, I love them for doing this. He would go through it line by line by line, word by word as to what I was doing right and what I was doing wrong. Like, for example, he said, you're ending your sentences weak. Uh, with, uh, not, you need to end your sentences with ED words, not ING words. ING words are weak. He said, think of it as a, a, a jazz musician doing a riff. He always ends his riff like ba 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 bum boom, hard, strong. That's the same way with a sentence. And he said, and leads and kickers are the only thing that really, you got to nail the lead and you got to nail the kicker. And Breslin, I would leave, leave a ton of stuff on his desk. And, um, you know, for weeks go by, he didn't, I didn't hear from him. And then one day we were in the elevator. It was a crowded elevator. He lit a cigar because he knew that would tick everybody off. And, uh, and he said, as we were getting out, he stopped me. And he said, uh, this pretty much the same thing with, that Pete said. You got to stop with the ING words. They're just too weak. You, you got to do better. And your leads need to be worked tightened. And so they were like, you know, it was like going to grad school, you know. It was yeah, like, yeah. And uh, and just listening and talk and and uh, you know going back and forth. I remember I had to do an article on somebody, uh, Neil Simon. So you go to the morgue, uh, the library, and you get all the clips. Yeah. And I was sitting at my desk with all these Neil Simon clips, and I had kind of my I looked a little down, and Breslin came over and said, "What's the problem?" I said, I don't know, JB. I mean, everybody's written about this guy. What am I going to write? And he threw all the clips on the floor. He said, nobody's written about him until you've written about him. Wow. So if you can't put that in your head, you're not in this business. 
And he said, I'm going to tell you something else too. He said, I know you're writing for $5, a, an article for five bucks and this article for seven and this article for eight. Don't worry about the money. Don't look at the money. Forget the money. You need clips. But if you make it, when you make it, you don't send out a Christmas card for less than five grand. So that was his whole uh, reasoning. And wow. uh, so between the two of them, Pete was more gentlemanly. Jimmy was more brusque. You know, that was his personality. But they were both very kind to me, and I will always kind of remember them fondly. How important is it to pay for a newspaper? People get their they get their news from Facebook for crying out. I can't no. do that. It, it, the, you're paying for it the privilege of the journalism you're paying yeah and you get to read you get to read you know the columns today i read the columnists today and they just sit at home they're sitting in their office right and jimmy used to believe that all the great stories you got on the fifth floor of a walk-up you got to go up that five floors bang on the desk on the door and that old lady or young old man is going to open that door and ask where the story is um and you know that's what they did so you know and my mother actually um, I would tell her Hamill and Breslin stories and she would, she actually never believed the writing thing. Here's when I knew I had my mother though, backing me up as a writer in the seventies. You're probably too young to remember this in the seventies. There were a couple of Italian American magazines launching. One was identity. Attenzione. And attenzione. My parent, you know what? My mother had every issue. There weren't, exactly. there so, weren't that many of them. The first article I wrote for a magazine was for Identity. It was about those unicorn horns. Remember those horns that Italian guys wore? Yeah, there you go. That, that. So I wrote that, and I, the magazine came. I put it on my mother's. I gave it to my mom, so she opened it on her lap with my byline and the story. And then I showed her the check that I got. They paid me one hundred and fifty dollars. Wow. So she looked at the check and looked at the article, and it kind of dawned on her. It was the first time she said you could actually get paid for this. I said, yeah, man, they do pay. I mean, I was making money at the news, but I was getting, you know, I was a gopher, I was a copy boy. And to her, I was a messenger, it was a waste of time. But it was the first time it said, all right, if you can do this, then she told me two things. One, don't tell your father you got paid, you know, cause he'll take the money. Two, um, if you can keep doing this, and then she actually pitched me a story she said, you know, you should write a story about, I said, oh, she was Padre Pio, remember Padre Pio? And I said, man, is that legit that he bleeds from, the, it was a priest, for those of you who don't know, allegedly he was a priest who, uh, whatever he served. Him. We believe in Padre Pio. Okay. Whenever he served, he was in every butcher shop in Hell's Kitchen, so I, he, and whenever he served mass, he would bleed from the wounds of Christ, from the hands, uh, the side, and uh, I assume this, his feet bled. Um, everybody in the, the men in the neighborhood said it's a gimmick. The guy, he's got something going. Why is he always bringing gauze pads with him? You know, <laughs> so, so, right. uh, my father didn't buy any of it. He said, it's ketchup. It's not blood. It's all a like scam to give you to pay more money. My mother religiously believed it. And, uh, so I did a piece on Padre Pio and I, I actually did believe it. Um, but he did the three, he's a saint now, right? I think. Pretty sure, right? One yeah, of the you smell the scent of roses, that's him at work. Is that true? That's true. That's what he's known for. To bring back to your sense of smell. No, it's just that sometimes a saint will have something that reminds you when they're in the area. Oh really? Oh, I didn't know. That. Your room and there's no roses in it and you smell them, it's him. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can find out about the shrine. They put the this is from uh, the Strand Bookstore. Yeah, you can find out about Padre Pio at the at the shrine, and he has the the oh, the shrine, the link to the shrine. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anyway, so that was my second art. Antonio, I didn't. Th I don't know how many issues there were. Not many. Not no, many. Yeah, there was an, none of the editors were Italian too. I, I, that was, you know, it was strange. But I got to write a column for them, and uh, so you know, slowly you build it up. And look, I I really believe. Every any if I would just my career was just meant to be a newspaper guy, I would have been okay with that. If it went to magazines, I would have been fine with that. And then in 88, 89, it just kind of blew up. I, I got a TV thing, I got a movie thing, I got a book thing. It all seemed to happen all at once. 
And the only one who seemed convinced that it would always happen was Susan. And just it, I mean, everybody. I, I was stunned. She was so proud of you and thought, but you let her. You let her like uh, you had her read stuff, didn't you? Oh, uh, she was my first read. She was Your a great first, editor. Okay. She was my first read, and she always got a two pencils sharpened. But she, I, I said, why do you think you need the pencil? Maybe it's like one of these stories that doesn't need anything. And she would just uh, make it tighter. And and uh, the last book I wrote when she was alive, she was she dealt she died of lung cancer, and I was having trouble with the last book because everything that was going on uh, with her it was it was you know obviously a major it was more important to, to be around her than to deal with a, a novel. It was called The Wolf, which Amazon Studios is just option for uh, Lorenzo di Bonaventura, yeah. the other Lorenzo, the richer Lorenzo. And uh, anyway, she asked me as a favor, we, uh, we were vacationing in Maine. She was one of the times she could get away from chemo. And she said, can you do me a favor? Can you finish that book? Because I was having, everybody knew, my agent, my editor, my everybody knew I was having trouble. Uh, and they were all great about it. Everybody said, take what, however long you need. She said, I'd like to read that book before I die. And, you know, that's putting a lot of, you know, it was like, okay. okay. And uh, and she loved my, the at the time, Mark Tavani was my editor. He was a great guy. And, great guy. And a great editor. And... Uh, so I finished the, the book and I gave it, to, I left it on Susan's uh, bed and she read it. It was about a, a month before she died actually. And uh, and she said, I think it's one of the best things you've ever done. I'm, and I'm, oh my I'm, God. So that kind of stayed with me. and, and uh, But she was a champion of it. I mean, she just believed in me. Describe, and Describe her as a person to folks because I thought she was, well, she was beautiful, she was a beautiful girl. Um, no nonsense, practical, right? Not, you know, bombastic or emotional or now she felt things and she was beautiful mother and wife. I mean, I absolutely, but she did not put her feelings in the street at all. Yeah, she's very, she's from the Midwest, you know, she's right. from Cincinnati so that, you know, they're not us. She always thought I was yelling. I said, this is how we talk. I, tell you, I mean, tell you, I'm not yelling. I just talk like that. But I, I so she was very, uh, she loved theater. She loved movies. She, I mean, she just read everything. But she can go from reading an Anthony, uh, from a, reading a Trollope novel to going to Jack Higgins and reading a Jack Higgins thriller. And then, you know, just reading everything. And what I most miss, I would come to the desk in the morning and there would be clips. She read everything. There would be clippings from newspapers or magazines or whatever, and, and with little note, this this you might use for a script, or this you might use for the book, or this you might use for another book. So I just put them in folders. And um, I know it sounds weird, but there are days when I come in here expecting to find, you know, clippings. No, stuff. that's not weird. I mean, you you know, that's not weird at all. And you know, it's just a veil between yeah. here and there. You know. I know, but. Um, so anyway, she she read everything I wrote. Uh, she didn't read the scripts. The scripts she she said, "Listen, I don't know enough about it. I know you. I, what I do know is you're gonna have to rewrite. You know the deal with scripts. You rewrite. You rewrite. You rewrite." She didn't want to read like 18 versions of it. Right. Um, and uh, and she felt with the people I was working with, uh, with Barry Levinson and the different people I got to work with. I, was I mean, Lorenzo Di Bonaventura. I mean, you work with the elite in Hollywood. Yeah, Lorenzo's a great guy, and uh, and Barry, I worked, I did three or four things with Barry. He's terrific. So she felt that end was, and the Law and Order people were, you know, super talented. Uh, Dick Wolf and his team, Michael Chernich, and, and so that she thought was covered on the book stuff. She knew the books, she knew the scripts, yeah, uh, the the books. She knew the articles. When we did, I, I, uh, my late uh, friend uh, Keith Bellows, the editor of the National Geographic Traveler. So through him, I got to cover Italy. So so great. And Susan would do all the legwork. You know what? You you've done magazine stuff where in the room it sounds like a great idea, and then you get there and it's like, who, who thought it? One of the crazy ideas we did. He wanted to put Venice on the cover, and the idea we we did in his office in D.C. was the hidden Venice, the Venice no one has ever seen, until we get to Venice and realize like everyone's seen everything of Venice. 
And Sue said, no, I'll find something. And she found these two tour guides because uh, money was no object to the natural. Oh, yeah. That has, it's gone now, right? It's, that it's gone. It's his gone. website, apparently. It doesn't even but, exist. But money was no object. So she found these two people. And they did find 10 places that a lot of, a lot of tourists don't go to see, like Casanova's uh, uh, cell, prison cell. A place where Hemingway, an island where Hemingway wrote a novel that didn't tell anybody that he was at that island. Um, so somehow magically she did that. When I did Florence, which led to me writing Midnight Angel, she got us into the Vistari Corridor, which until then we had to go in with a tour guide. But until then, only the only person that had gone in there was Al Gore after the 2000 election. And the tour guide said, you know, he was so depressed. I don't understand why he was so depressed. I said, well, he kind of just, you know, lost the election. And she goes, I know, but you'd think he would be excited to be here. I said, you know, I, I, I'm sure he'd rather be in the White House. Um, but uh, so she would find these things. So her, she was the legwork and I was the, uh, I just would home, go home and put it to paper. Fantastic. Well, I am so Hi. sorry to interrupt, but since we just have about 10 minutes or so left, I did want to transition to the audience questions, of which we have a few. Okay. Then, Fantastic, Sabur. Excellent. I think a good one to begin with is from Madonna, and it's actually in the Madonna? Yeah. <laughs> wow. I love her music. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> She asks, Lorenzo and Adriana, could you tell us about the difference between writing for a book and writing for film? And maybe let's start off with Lorenzo and then go Adriana. Good. I think, uh, well, it, it's different. Writing for film, as Adriana will tell you, it's all, it's all dialect, um, dialogue, rather. And, you know, a book is the full boat. The, the script is a skeleton of a story, pretty much. Um, like I once, the first script I did, I put uh, in the across the page, which I guess would be the narrative. I once put, I put in um, the character's name. I forgot the character's name, but he carries a photo of his brother in his wallet at all times. And the producer I was working with crossed that out. He goes, how do we know that? We'll, we'll never see it. We gotta, you gotta show us. So it's a show me, you have to show everything. Everything in the script has to be seen you, because it's a visual medium. In a book, you could, I could put that in a book that you keep a photo of your brother in your wallet. It's it's great. So also, you have to keep in mind, you know, there's a budget here. You can't have. I mean, the first Law and Order episode I wrote, I had a guy die during a marathon race with fifty thousand people watching, and I got a call from the the editor said the story editor saying, "What are you out of your mind? We're gonna have like at most ten people in the park." So it's a skeleton of a story. The dialogue is crucial, and the characters are crucial. Adrian. That's a really good answer. Uh, the difference is, you, you know, a, a book is the whole world, but you know if you're a dramatist, if you um, think in dialogue, if you think in conversation, and, and you, you also have to create the whole world for a movie, that's for sure, but it is a different form because you might just have someone look across a crowded room at someone and it might be two chapters in your book. You know, so it, it, it's that, it, it's a different way of, of viewing it. And I always say, take playwriting. I never understood in Hollywood why they didn't push that. I was a theater major and they teach you how to write a play. Then you, you take that into television and film. Not that they're the same thing, but you have a sense of how a scene is constructed and how it builds to in, in, within a narrative. And that's why Adri's right. That's why some of the best uh, TV and movie writers are playwrights, like Aaron Sorkin, for example. Yes, yes, yes. Because he's, he's already known, he knows the structure of telling the story visually. Yes. Right, which you learn through in the but, theater. You know, but Lorenzo, aren't you always surprised? I'm always surprised um, at who's writing because there's like no template of the kind of person. Now listen, when I went to Hollywood, I, I mean, I some people went to all the same school and I was like, hey, there were funny people where I went to school. They don't get in there. Right. And that, but that's changing now. Right. It's a really club. Crazy. It was a club. It was, it was a, a real club. club. Right. You, you had to work at the Harvard Lampoon. All right. And a lot of, you know, that you hear these stories that they don't read. There's a fa very famous story about uh, Gerald uh, Green, who was the first writer. Do you know this story? The first writer to sell his book to Hollywood for $100,000. Wow. 
This is in the uh, in the fifties. It was called The Last Angry Man, and he's sitting across from uh, Harry Cohen, who was the head of the legendary head of Columbia Pictures. So he's about in his mid twenties, uh, uh, Gerald Green, and he's sitting there. And within five minutes, he realizes not only has Harry Cohen not read the book, he doesn't even know what it's about. So he finishes his thing, and Harry Cohen says, "Well, kid, is there anything you want to ask me?" And you know, when you're 24 and you just got a hundred grand for a book in the 50s, you're kind of brash. Right. He said, "Yeah, there is a question I'd like to ask you. Why would you give me the kind of money you're giving me for a book you didn't read?" And Harry Cohn said, "Kid, a book this good, I don't have to read." And that's right. That was Hollywood then. But the ones I've done business with, and I'm sure Adri has, read a lot. They do read a lot. They do. They do. But listen, they like something juicy. I was told on my first day in Hollywood, here's the perfect pitch for a television show. He's the Pope. She's a cheerleader. They're detectives. <laughs> it works. Yeah. It works. It does work. Yeah, they love that one line, which drives you crazy. Oh, oh I can love the log line. Uh, what's your book about? Oh, I don't know how to explain it. The best log, I wrote a, a World War II book called Street Boys years ago, which I sold to Lorenzo. And uh, my lawyer, my entertainment lawyer, Jake Bloom, came up with the great uh, log line. It was a, the street kids of Naples uh, got together to beat back a, a, Tanz a Panzer division, a Nazi Panzer division. So somebody asked him, what's the book about? He goes, orphans against Nazis, orphans win. That was it. It's the best one liner ever. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really great one i got the book sold too so. there you go that's what matters our next question is from and correct me if this is mispronounced edie who says uh lorenzo do you prefer writing fiction or non-fiction and why i well you know this book was a special uh, this was a, from the heart so this book um, I don't consider this nonfiction. I just think this is this this is my story to these three women, a love letter to these three women. Is it better? Uh, so, in general, I prefer fiction because you can have a great time. You can play with the characters. You can make stuff up. Uh, you can have doing crazy things. And I write from I don't know I don't know if Adria. This is book uh, thanks to my agent. Um, I don't usually outline books, but this one I did outline uh, against. I didn't want to do it, but she kind of pushed and pushed and pushed and in her own gentle way. And uh, she was right because I follow the outline pretty closely. But with fiction, I don't outline. I kind of fly from the seat of my pants. And I love that. You know, eventually, sometimes you put yourself in a corner, as you know, Adrian, you don't know, like, if you're going to get out. But it's you just kind of make up characters, you make up dialogue and you use stuff from your past and from your own life, uh, people you've known and, you know, dial stories you've heard. Um, you know, and you put them in the books, don't you, Adrian? I mean, I think exactly, yeah. exactly. And then, and then you're desperately trying to find, you know, that character that turns the corner, and you go out and get something to eat, and you hear two people talk, and it goes in the book. Right. I know. Also, if you hang out with uh, the kind of guys we hung out with at Manda Cottage, you pick up. All you have to do is sit there. It's like one story after another after another. Uh, I mean, I heard a story of Amanda Kaiser, which I actually put in a script. Uh, ten uh, wise guys, ten mob guys were eating in a restaurant. And uh, it was part of Gotti's crew, I think. And they got up. The kid, there was a new waiter, and he put the check on the table. They got up without paying. So the kid got the check, and he ran after them. Excuse, they said, excuse me, sir, you, you didn't pay your bill. And one of them turned around. They, were, they later paid. They were just teasing him. They turned around. They said, kid, we're crying crime don't pay and they walked out of the restaurant so that i used in a script that's a you know that's, that's a great, great line yeah. and so you pick up stuff like that see but you have to hang out with people that adrian and i hang out with that's right you have to go to Puglia's. <laughs> exactly <laughs> right uh, yes you or wherever to, else we go yes some of the restaurants we go shall be nameless but uh yes um well so for our final question of the evening, and it's to both of you, I'm going to rephrase this a little, so Isabel, forgive me, but Isabel asks, 
Italian American art seemed to be in vogue in the 90s and 80s, but we see less Italian American voices today. As Italian American writers, what do you think your responsibility is? If you think you have a responsibility to tell Italian American stories, well, I feel very strongly about it. But Adria, you want to go first? Or... Why don't I go first? Because it's your show, Lorenzo. I'm going to say this. You know, we spend a lot of time thinking about this because you know, when you're raised Italian, you're not supposed to put your business in the street. You know, but there are. A, a large swath of Italian American writers that are really great. And if I had brain cells left at the end of the day, if I, it was 10 o'clock in the morning, I could do it. But there are so many great Italian American writers and uh, of Italian descent. So I would say um, it might have seemed hot because of the movies. Hmm. But it, I think it is ever so hot because the great novelists right now are writing Italian characters. Right. I mean, Kristen Hannah's book has, you know, Italian in I mean, it could keep going. There's a bunch of them. So, um, so even people that aren't Italian get the Italian of it. We go in and out of style, but we're always classic. And so I'm going to punt to Lorenzo. I think, I think, the, I think Adri's on the mark and there's some great Italian novelists working out. Richard Russo is, is, is one example. Of yes. That. Um, I just think we were born, I think we're born storytellers. Now, the opportunity's not there. I mean, in the 50s, it wasn't there at all. I was very close to Evan Hunter at McBain, whose actual name was Sal Lambino, and he couldn't get published as Salvatore Lambino. So sad. In the 50s, he had to change his name, and that got the Blackboard Jungle published. Mm -hmm. and he went into, he, he said he went home that night. He was down to his last $500. He went home that night, went through the phone book and found the waspiest name he could come up with, which was Evan Hunter. Because his agent said, it's not the book, uh, Sal, it's the it's the name. So, um, but now, you know, the head of Random House, one of the heads of Random House is Gina Centrello. We got, you know, nobody invited us to this party, but we're not leaving now. Right, exactly. <laughs> and how about David Baldacci, the great Baldacci. David Baldacci, the great Nelson DeMille. Yes. Um, I don't want to leave out the women. Uh, Lisa Scottolini. Oh my, how could we, we just did the eternal tour. Lisa Scottolini, another great one. Um, and she really writes oh, a lot. Anna, I think Anna Quinlan's Italian, right? Her mother was Italian. Yes, right. absolutely. We'll take half. We, you know, we take it all. We <laughs> I love when Stanley Tucci says both sides. Both yeah, both sides. sides. He makes it a point. I'm Italian on both sides. He didn't need both sides. Anyone. Yeah, he just could have said I'm Italian, but no, I'm Italian. I got both, both sides. Side. Both sides. Yeah. <laughs> No step. fake Italian here. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you have you have you have great Italian American writers out there, and they're going to be more. I mean, I think also they got to push it. I mean, they got to, you know, they got to read the young ones. Have to read the older ones. They got to read. Helen games. Berlini, Helen Berlini, uh, Pietro Del Donato. You could keep going, Carlo yeah. Levi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Car Christ in Concrete. You got to read. You got to read uh, Gates Elise's three great magazine uh, pieces of journalism, which changed how magazine journalism was written, uh, including probably what they call the greatest magazine piece ever written was Frank Sinatra as a cold. As a cold yeah. yeah. I think it was. If you read that, that's like going to school. I mean, it, it yeah. literally is. Yeah, you're right. It really cool. is. And he you're didn't, right. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, he, he never interviewed, he never in that whole piece, never asked Sinatra a single question. It's a, it's all observational. It's all observation of what, yeah. And the same thing he did with Joe DiMaggio and the same thing he did with Frank Costello at the time was the head of organized crime. Uh, Gay, Gay Talese is something else. Yes. I mean, you probably know him better than me, but. And he's, he's a fun, ex you know what he likes? He likes the give and take. He loves, he's a. He likes to fight. He loves to fight. If you. If, if, came after if, him right away and I was like, oh, please. If you don't I'll argue. Do for, buddy. Yeah, if you don't argue with him, he gets bored and he walks away. He walks away. You got to fight with him. I think I'm going to have to bother the both of you for a list after this that we can give to the audience later. You but on that note, I think we are at the hour, so unfortunately this conversation will have to end. To our audience, if you haven't already purchased Three Dreamers and if you're watching on Crowdcast, you can click the Purchase Three Dreamers button. If you're watching via Facebook, there's a link in the comments. Thank you so much. Thank Brent. you. Everybody, Lorenzo, congratulations. Thank Happy you. Happy birthday.
Thank let's, you. Let's, let's get everybody in America to read it and buy Thank it. Thank you, Adri. Thank yeah. you, Strand, and say hi to Nancy. And uh, yeah, and love It's always in my heart. So. Thank you so much. Have a Thank good you. night. All right. Bye, guys. Care, guys.